This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, all right, we're back, we're live. It's the five o'clock rock uh, with Haruko Moma. Did I get that right? Yes, it's perfect, Jay. All right, okay. Yes. And she's here to, uh, to speak in a conference about Old English. And uh, is, this, is this the one right here, this conference yes, over here? Yes, that's me. Okay. I just gave this paper. Just gave this paper. She's from the University of Toronto now, but there's other schools we'll talk about. <laughs> And uh, the, the paper was entitled uh, uh, Later, 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 Efric. Efric is a person. Alfred. 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 Yes. Very good. Alfred. You can be an Anglo Saxon, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to teach me a lot here. The John Collins Pope Papers and the task of the translator. Mm -hmm. So we are talking, when you talk like that, you're talking about translating like a foreign language into the modern... That's the idea. Old yeah. English is so different from yeah, modern yeah. English. So you let me, let me get a handle on all this. I think this is going to be interesting to yeah. see who you are, okay? Mm -hmm. You are the chief editor of the Dictionary of Old English at the University of Toronto in Canada, which is a great city. We'll talk about I, that. Yeah, it's, it's great. Come visit me in yeah. Canada. Yeah, it's cold though. Yeah. It, it's now warm. Yeah. So now he's a good. Do you like Trudeau? Uh, he's so good looking. Okay. Right. <laughs> good answer. Yes. <laughs> and she is the Ang Angus Cameron Professor of Old English Language and Literature, and Professor of Medieval Studies and English, and she is a Japanese yes. uh, Anglo-Saxonist, so to say. That's right. A JASP, if yes. you will. Yeah. You gave me my new I, I title. It, okay. I'm a jazz. So <laughs> and before cool. she arrived in Toronto, which was only recently, a month ago, I she taught at New York University, my school, for yeah, 25 years. Yeah. And I went to the law school there. I went to the law school twice. It's not that I I had to go twice. <laughs> But you chose to go twice. I chose to go twice yeah. for, for a law degree and then a master's in a law degree. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it helps me understand old English. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And NYU Law School, it's a really good one. If you haven't noticed, she is originally from Japan and she yes, started studying at Hokkaido University. And then the big break, she got a scholarship to study at the University of, of Toronto. And it all, it, the rest is history, so to say. Absolutely. In fact, it's all history, isn't it? It's, yes. Old English is a 1,000 year old language. So, so the other thing I wanted to mention in, in introducing you is that uh, uh, Caramon Lee gave me a copy of a speech. I don't know if is this the speech you gave. No, this is a speech you gave on June twentieth yeah. for the Saint George Saint George's Society in Toronto. And I have uh, I have members of my family who speak a lot, you know, yes. uh, all over, and you know they always write it out like this in advance. Well, you see, it's, it's, I knew, and I was nervous, Jay, so I needed to, something to hang on to. Yeah. But it was fun. People liked it. People laughed. Where, where was that, the St. George's Society? Uh, well, we had a, um, uh, the president's donor meeting, and one of the members uh, uh, has a beautiful house and gardens in, I think it's in North York. And you know, having lived in Manhattan for 25 years, it was like a palace, huge. And a lot of people were there, members of the society. And I talked about Old English. Well, that's the thing, you know, I, I, I come to believe that if you want to give a really good speech, yes. you have to put the words in your mind somehow. And so you have to write it out. And right. I was reading this and I was saying, gee, this is really well written. The, the language flows. This was written by somebody for whom language must flow. Am I right? Do you see language differently than most human beings who walk on the street? That's a really good question, but I, I think when I'm myself, then language flows. And this was really about my experience, uh, how I became interested in Old English uh, in Japan, and how I crossed the Pacific Ocean. To and the great language divide. That's right. And uh, so you know, it just flew naturally for me. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I love what to... You, what got you started in such a, such a voyage, a journey? That's a really good question, because I was just an ordinary English major in Japan. Yeah, of which there are many. There are many. Of, of course, everyone loves to study English in Japan. Yes. And I was one of them. Yes. But I think my thing is that I like history. I like 
old things. So for me, the first old, old English was Shakespeare. Hamlet or Henry the Fourth. You say that with such loving tones. Yes, I mean, <laughs> who doesn't love Shakespeare? Quote but me a piece. I, I well, no, I'm too shy, and I can quote from Old English, but okay, you know, I want that. <laughs> uh, should I? Yes. Well, you know, but it doesn't sound like anything we know, you know. But if it's okay, Beowulf. Uh, it's it's the beginning part of Beowulf. What? Twe gardena in yardagum, theod the cunning thrum frunon, whoza etzelingus ellen fremedon. Now translate this for me. What does it mean? Yes, I'd like to know. <laughs> no, it's just a, it's about the poet. The idea is this oral culture, at least, you know, the idea. And everyone is having a good time at the banquet, drinking beer. And uh, here is this court poet coming in to sing a song about the hero Beowulf. And everyone is so, you know, uh, wrapped up with their own conversation. And in order to say, listen up, I'm here. What? You know, like the uh, rap music, what, right? Uh, what? So listen, right? We, we, you and I all know about the, uh, the old glory of the Danes. Actually, the poem is not about the Anglo-Saxons or English people. They're all about the Scandinavians. And we know all these princes and heroes re-achieved great deeds. So don't we all know about these amazing people? So let's talk about them. So it's a really good way to be together, yeah. sharing the same culture. Yeah. And I think that's why I love Old English. It takes you there. Absolutely. It, it takes you a thousand years back. Absolutely. You, you're living there. Just say what? And then yeah. you go, yes, we are there, right? Yeah, yes, we yeah, are there yeah. with the heroes and uh, the queen. And yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not fiction. It's real. Well, in the sense that, you know, there are some historical figures or legendary figures. So I'm very sure in olden days when this tradition really emerged, they must have been thinking about their ancestor or some superhero. It's really like superheroes, you know, uh, today. That's, that's part of the species, isn't it? We need heroes. We do. For leadership for who knows what to admire, to aspire. Uh, yeah, absolutely right. And Beowulf was one of them. So who is Beowulf? Uh, that's a really good question. You know, I have my idea of Beowulf, you know, really handsome and, you know, really intelligent, <laughs> really strong. Probably. Was, uh, was his hair long? You know, well, that's the interesting thing. Usually when you read older, uh, right, later medieval poems like um, Lancelot, you know, we kind of, you know, um, Guinevere had like, um, you know, blonde hair and gray eyes. Beowulf doesn't tell you about this. It's not about how people looked, but what they did. did. So Beowulf uh, saved the Danes by fighting with this cannibalistic monster, Grendel. <laughs> and what kind of a monster is Grendel? Well, is it, can I see it on late night TV? Uh, well, probably you, you, you said you watched some, you know, I see some, some shows. Of yeah. Well, he <laughs> is a cannibal. But what's really interesting? Gren Grendel. Gr yeah. Gren Grendel. Grendel. Yeah, Grendel. Grendel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is, is a cannibal. Yeah, they but have he, cannibals in Europe. Well, that's a really good question. Only in the fiction, yeah. Well, but you know, he is a descendant of Cain, so he is biblical. Cain? Cain, Cain, you know, like Cain, Cain and Abel. Abel. Cain? Yes, yes. So he is. Is this uh, identified in Beowulf? Does it's he in the poems because you see, so it runs with yeah. the, the Bible. It is this, this references and biblical references. Absolutely. You got it right because Beowulf is about this heroic age. Everyone is pagan; they don't know Christ, but the poet knows better. So he sees this world. Oh, it's a glorious world, but they were pagans. Oh, isn't this sad? But they had their glory. And even a pagan hero can fight with a king's descendant and have a true victory. And then he becomes a king. So I think that's why Beowulf is so appealing. Yeah, well, it, 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 even if it's fiction, 
even if it, because I'm not yeah. satisfied it's fiction. I think it may, it may be rooted in many ways in reality at the time. It teaches you so much Absolutely. about the way of thinking. Yes. The way of dealing with language, expressing mm -hmm, yourself mm -hmm. a thousand years ago. We don't know that from the movies. They don't really tell us. Oh. In fact, you know, even the history books don't really tell us. You have to put flesh on those bones. Mm -hmm. The way you do it is through the poetry, no? Absolutely. So you see, the stereotype is, you no. Know, if you have, like, muscle, you, you don't have as much thing in, in here. But Beowulf was powerful and smart at the same time. That's why I admire Beowulf. Yeah. So he gives amazing speeches. You know, he has this speech match with someone who challenges him. A speech him. match? Yeah. Like a debate? De yeah, debate. Like, you know, oh, you're that Beowulf, you know, uh. didn't you, you know, lose that fight when you're young and how dare? They're you ranking know. each other. Yeah, but the then yeah. he defeats his <laughs> opponent by saying, "Well, you're right, Mr. Unfelt. You know, I, you know, I see your point. But this is a true story. Yeah. And didn't you yeah. kill your own brother? I would never do that. So you know, he is a winner. It sounds through. like it sounds like early political is what it does. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the you know, old English speakers and the Anglo-Saxons, yeah. they loved language. Their language, their words, new words, interesting words like kennings. Have you heard of kennings? Kennings. Yeah. Okay. So okay, here's a riddle. Uh, there is a w word at, at the beginning of Beowulf, railroad. Railroad. No, not railroad. Is Close. Whale road. Ra whale like the, the, the creature in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So what, it, what does whale road together do you think means? It's a, it's a metaphor called a kenning. Well, so just imagine a, a whale driving the road. A whale road. Whale road. Rail. Uh, not whale road. So the fish road. So fish road. Uh, yeah, fish road. So it's the ocean. Yeah. Uh, what about this? Is easier. Okay. Heaven's candle. Heaven's candle. Yeah. What's that? There's a candle in, in so, the sky. Yes. It's it's the moon, the sun. The sun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So those are called kennings. Now they really loved these. Uh, word plays. Oh, can you? Did you get what just I said? Oh, I'm smarter than you. Oh, you got it right. You know, and that's how they communicated. They loved beautiful and, poems and metaphors and beautiful poems. But Absolutely. the language was different. And it seems to me that you know, as as all things were provincial and local in those days, and mm. localities had yeah. you know different different style, different cultures, different ways of speaking, True. you could take the same subject matter mm -hmm. from this place and articulate it in, this, in as close a way as impossible in that place, but it was in different language because the words, the pronunciation was You're different. You're right. Yeah. So, you know, if you really want to know, you know, I'm a philologist, Jay. Do you know what a philologist mm -hmm. words. does? Words. It's all about words. I love words. It's not words. about collecting stamps. Well, so yeah, yeah, <laughs> close, you know, we love words, we collect words. The Anglo-Saxons talked about word hoard in our chest. You open your mouth, you let all these words come out, right? So, so you know, and philologists talk about dialects in Anglo-Saxon England, early West Saxon, Mercian, Northumbrian. I'm not going to bore you, but yes, they had so many different ways. You couldn't bore me. Uh, are you sure? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I can later, you know, uh, have a derivation of the word kazeum. Kazeum? Uh, kazeum really means cheese in late Latin. And how kazeum went through a number of sound changes to eventually become cheese. So uh, philologists do such goofy things. I'm one of those goofy people. But, and, you know, dialects, they're all different. But what's really interesting is that they seem to have understood poetic words. You know, maybe they remembered from the past. Yes, they sound a little bit archaic, but if you love poetry, you know what these words poetry mean. Poetry is ultimately sounds. That's right. And then when I grew up in New York, we had an expression that sounds a lot like what you were talking oh, about earlier. What is it? it was this. You meet somebody in the street, you mm -hmm. haven't seen them in six months, mm -hmm. you get very close to them, you know, European yes. close, and you say, what? No, no, I didn't do that right. What? 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 Oh. We're going to take a break now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back.
Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. We're back. I told you we're coming back. <laughs> Haruko Moma, and she's a professor of what? Of, of Old English history studies, poetry, whatnot, Beowulf, and all those things back a thousand years ago. Yes, all of those things into one. That's into me. Into one, yeah. Yes. And mm -hmm. she's dedicated her professional career to that. Mm -hmm. And you can see that she's dedicated in general to that as a person, as a human being person. And so. Take me. I am Old English. Uh, yes, exactly, mm -hmm. and, and to, to a degree, you know, you can't be as good about that uh, if you don't actually live in Old England. Oh, yes, yes. Walk down the street and see, see the references and, and hear the callings and hear the poetry and everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I suppose when somebody tells you in the store, you know, that'll be a dollar half for the newspaper, you say, gee, I wonder what sounds there are sounds that emanated in Old English. Well, um... Maybe uh, I can. Okay, I can give you like an in, in, interesting example. I was talking with an anthropologist yesterday, and uh, he was, you know, he gave a really great lecture at the conference. And so I said to him, "Well, you know, you must be, you know, observing, you know, us Anglo-Saxons because he's an anthropologist. Like you would observe the, um, you know, the, 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 you know, whatever culture that he was studying." And he got a little bit embarrassed. No, I'm not observing you. And then I said, well, but you see, whenever I see the world, I read the world as I would read an old English text. I'm reading, reading you, Jay, as I would read Beowulf. Well, yes. you know what you what you do when you when you talk that way mm -hmm. is you're you're looking at me not as I am today, but I am but the accumulation of layers and generations, mm -hmm. twenty, thirty, fifty generations, whatever it is, to mm -hmm. take me back to that time. Yeah. I am not I am not who I seem to be. I am I am the, the legacy of that. I'm yeah. right, I'm the, the current iteration of what was going on back in the time you're studying. Well, it's more like a true you. You, you know, Jay, you're amazing, and you're you're great. Uh, but the true you inside of you is even greater. And philologists can really see, you know, look at you, and somehow we understand what's what's inside of you. And I I think that I just I just read the world. Do you have trouble sometimes, you know, getting current? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. Uh, For example, you know, high tech. I mean, how can you look? 140 characters, I think they expanded that. Uh -huh. 140 <laughs> characters on Twitter. Yeah. I mean, for example, mm -hmm. what the president, your president, and mine, I suppose. Well, uh, yes. Donald Trump, you know, what mm -hmm. he says in 140 characters, it may not be of the same quality of poetry <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. as you may be studied. <laughs> that is kind of true, but uh, I, I think, you know, one word can tell you, you know, uh, so much, 140. Uh, but what I, I should like to point out that, you know, I'm now. Uh, uh, the the editor of the Dictionary of Old English, yes. and this is a state of the art uh, lex lexicon. You know, it's all digitized, and okay, I don't do it. Our systems analysts can do these things, but so this is really a medievalist. That's, Jay, that's a great honor. Uh, really this is not a small thing. It's, You're it's the a, editor of the the, yeah. the, the dictionary of yeah. Old English, mm -hmm. and how thick. Well, you see, it's so big because um, there are three million word occurrences in Old English. You cannot print that out. That's why everything is digitized. Ah, so it's not a book. Well, it's a digital. It's a digital book. It's called a corpus. Yeah. Uh, everything we have from the Old English period has been digitized, and what we are doing right now, you know, what we editors are doing. Uh, right now is to look at this corpus, checking each and every example, be that uh, 
the word love, luvu, or I don't know, bishop, bishop, uh, whatever word. We examine everything, and that's possible because of this latest technology. So we do both. Is it pronouncing? Is it a pronouncing dictionary? Uh, we should do that, shouldn't we? Yeah, that's but. the next project. <laughs> So, but where do you start and where do you end? For example, you say, well, 1066. What was 1066? Mm -hmm. It was an important yeah, year. That that's was the, the, yeah, Norman, the Norman, Norman invasion Congress. of yeah. England. Yeah. So mm -hmm. maybe stop there. That, that was, you know, September 1066. That's no. it. You remember the date of the, uh, the battle, battle of Hastings? <laughs> well, that's what people used to say. Old English period ends, you know, uh, you know, in 1066. But we have a different view now because. You see, political change does not always, you know, mean that you know. In you know, 1066, people st you know, stopped talking Old English. Now we are speaking Middle English. It doesn't work that That's way. That's your next project. So, no, so it just went on. So actually, the Old English corpus I was telling you about it. It really goes all the way to the 13th century. Sometimes they wrote down Old English writings, like sermons and homilies. They're really, really good and persuasive it was before the printing homilies. Press. Yeah, it was before so the printing everything press. had to everything be done. Everything by hand on parchment. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so, you know, Old English really is longer and more, um, longer lasting. Is than it more the, beautiful than today's language? Well, I'm biased, so don't ask me, I Jay, mean, I because, the the, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I don't want to, you know. Uh, well, let's assume it is. Why is it more beautiful? That's a really good question. You see, this is really about love, you know, when, you know, you, you just told, you know, the audience that I grew up in Japan and I was an English major and I thought I liked the English language, but I liked old English better than modern English. Why? You, now you said before it was about history. Well, it's just the it was way the intersection no, of history and no, language. No, that's what you said. It it just the the way it sounded. Yes, I loved Beowulf when I my old English was good enough to be able to read Beowulf. You wrote your masters on Beowulf. Yeah, but even you know I I I wrote my. You have great memory, Jay. You're amazing. <laughs> I wrote my honors thesis on the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Okay. But it really doesn't matter if it's uh, in a biblical translation or a medical recipe or I anything law. <laughs> It just the language is so powerful. Yeah, was yeah. it more powerful? You know, yeah. The thing about it is poetry, mm -hmm. in my view, mm -hmm. is always more powerful than street language. You know, the language of yeah. commerce, trade, daily life. Mm -hmm. Poetry mm -hmm. is, by definition, inherent in the notion of poetry is, yeah, we thought about it. We thought about what we, whether we are saying exactly what we want to say, yeah, yeah. and whether the music of it is there. It has mm -hmm. to have music. Yeah, absolutely. Language and music. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, okay. I, I confess, you know, I'm biased, and I love poetry. Yeah. And uh, you're right. You know, um, I could never say it myself, but now that you expressed it in in verse, now that was exactly what I wanted to say. That's that's poetry, right? Yeah. And you know, old English speakers composed beautiful poems. Well, so it's just you know, their their language. It's the ancestor of the English language. So, um, so I mean, maybe that's why you know, uh, modern English is also powerful. It just goes back to that period. Yeah. Well, right. Yeah. It has roots. Yeah. Yeah. It has mm -hmm. roots. Absolutely. And I guess you know part of this this bias you're talking about is if you listen to English today, mm -hmm. it has deteriorated some of these things. The notion of poetry, the notion of music, yeah. it's not the same as it was say a thousand years ago. Um, right. And especially when you know I, I wanted to. I wanted to get you to read. There's Which a, one? There's one thing in your paper there. Maybe yes. you can find it faster than me. It's in italics here. Uh huh. And it is so beautiful, but I don't understand it at all. Ah, here. Well, here. yes. Okay. This is from Geoffrey. Geoffrey. Yeah. Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and that qualifies for Old English, right? Oh, uh, it's kind of late, but it's still like true English. What what, what year, roughly? Uh, he was from the 14th century. 14th century. That's, and well, that's he's way a way after 1066. Middle, yeah. middle English middle guy. English. Okay. But his language is also really beautiful. Okay, I can't pronounce it, but maybe you can, and then you can 
Well, so, Jay, you can try them. I, I, I won't make it sound like poetry. Well, well you I don't will know. I, okay, there it is. Yeah. Can well, you can you make the poetry for for our sound system? But I'm an, so people can. Well, I'm an old English person, but I can try. Okay, so okay. it's the beginning of the Canterbury Tales, right? Yes, the okay. general prologue, okay. and it's really about um, you know when you know April uh, kind of you know uh, with its sweet shower has pierced the dryness of March to its root. So that's what it means. But it's poetry. So, so March is dry. March is dry. The shower is the rain. Yeah, April, April is the shower uh, month. And, and then all the flowers come out in May. Then, it's beautiful. Then people want to go on the pilgrimage to go to Canterbury. And so that's Hence the, the Canterbury Tales. That's right. So it's really about people going on uh, their pilgrimages and the uh, people telling stories. So okay. it, it's like, but you know, okay, my middle English colleagues would, you know, say, do okay, you yeah, be okay. Than what I could do. Juan sat April with his sure sote, the drucht of March has pierced to the rote. Does that sound like poetry to you? It does. Oh, good. It does. Yeah. But I mean, would everyone in, in say the uh, year fourteen hundred would everyone understand that, or would you would you have would you have to explain that in some other context to make the average person understand that? Well, that's a, probably this is for a more sophisticated audience. But we have to remember that in the Middle Ages, the learned people were supposed to know Latin. That means. English was a vernacular language, not that prestigious. And what was amazing was that these poets, Chaucer, the anonymous Beowulf poet, proved that yes, Latin is the language of knowledge, you know, closer to salvation or something. But our humble vernacular language can move us. It, it can be really beautiful. So it's supposed to be for everyone, but everyone who speaks language of their own, but also who is mindful of the beauty of that language. So I think that's why Chaucer and the Beowulf poet were so great. Uh, yeah. And did they gyre and gimbal in the wave? <laughs> Jabberwocky. Jabberwocky. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> Lewis Carroll really made fun of anglo saxons but I think he really appreciated the <laughs> culture as well. <laughs> and Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Yeah. There's lots mm -hmm. of lots mm -hmm. of the old English in Shakespeare. Absolutely, isn't because you know we say that Shakespeare really had the greatest vocabulary ever, at least in in his generation. But even then, more than ninety percent of the words he used really came from the old English period. They were rooted in what people knew mm -hmm. I mean, up through the generations. Absolutely. So um, I guess, you know, we are almost out of time. Oh, going? I could I'm keep so going. I'm so sorry we could do this all yeah, day. And, yeah. and we, we only began to explore it. Yeah. Um, and I really appreciated your reading. But I, I have to ask you this question. Sure. Come the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, know, you, you look naughty, though. You look I, naughty. I, you're right. You, you read my mind. It's a naughty question. Okay. <laughs> so you studied this all your like, academic life. Yes. And you love it beyond description. I can tell. Mm -hmm. They can all tell. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But they mm -hmm. haven't studied it. Right. They don't know anything about Beowulf these days. Or Chaucer. Okay. Well, there's a movie. There's a movie. Yeah, maybe some do. Yeah, games like, told me like put this in No Child Wolf. Left Behind, you know. Oh, okay. They left yeah. this kind behind. So my question well, to you okay. is, all the people out there mm -hmm. who yes. are listening today, will yes. listen tomorrow and the day after, uh -huh. why should they care about this? Right. There's camera one. Can you tell them why? Well, uh, a, it's really, actually, it's the language you're speaking, and it's the powerful language, and if you know the past, you know the present. It's a really uh, beautiful language, poetry is wonderful. Uh, well, give it a try, I'm very sure you love it, because without the past, we are not complete. If you love the past, you you respect people around you. I can't explain this, but it makes you uh, wiser, 
better, more insightful person. But if you, ha if you doubt that, let me know. I can teach you how to read Old English. And you know, just uh, <laughs> let me know. I think I am right. Karuko Moma, it's been wonderful to talk so to you. So wonderful to and see you, And I only you, have Jay. one other word to say. Oh, yeah. yes. What? 